All right, good morning. Uh, here goes take two. Uh, this is the lecture, the first lecture on discovery. So we started um, last week, we finished last week the unit on motions, right? We've uh, so far talked about pleadings, the documentary conversation that begins, a civil lawsuit. We've talked about service, the special rules for delivering documents in the context of civil litigation. And then we did motions. Uh, requests for judicial decision short of trial or appeal. So we come now to discovery and to, uh, to the task of getting the facts out, right? So far we've been dealing in uh, kind of narrative advocacy and people telling their stories and people kind of talking about procedural questions about how, how the suit's going to go forward and some substantive uh, injunctions and so forth. But so far in our walk down this road, we have yet to get at the real facts, right? And if we're gonna be doing justice and we're gonna be letting people assert and protect their legal rights, then we want to be doing so on the basis uh, of a reliable knowledge of what actually happened to give rise to the dispute. And discovery is how we do that, right? Discovery is how the facts come out. And we've got different methods for discovery. You can think of discovery as a toolbox of techniques whereby your client and the adversary parties will, uh, will, will get access to the truth. Today we talk about documentary discovery, which is to say production of documents and, uh, and emails that are relevant to the matter at hand. Uh, and then on Tuesday we'll get to oral discovery and some other techniques of discovery as well. So the basic policy of the law that you need to understand about discovery is that it's supposed to be a voluntary and cooperative process that the parties engage in without any court involvement. We'll see the court sometimes has to come in in the case of a dispute about discovery, but discovery is not supposed to require any of that. And in many cases, it, it doesn't in fact require any court involvement whatsoever. In this regard, uh, it might be a little bit like the Crown Disclosure Obligation that you're familiar with from criminal law, where the Crown is required to voluntarily uh, take the initiative to disclose its entire case, the defense, without any, uh, without any court having to order it to do so. And what that means, the benefit of that for your client is that they don't have to spend any money or time if the system's working as it should, getting the other side to disclose the facts that your client needs to rely upon. The other important general policy of the law about discovery um, is that more facts is generally better, right? Litigation is supposed to be a search for truth. So in principle, the more relevant information that comes out, uh, the better. But as we'll see, there are some reasons why that uh, why that tendency towards more fulsome disclosure can be limited. Right, so when it comes to documentary discovery, these are the two key rules, and they were in, uh, in your assigned readings. Um, the first one uh, introduces the concept of disclosure. Rule 30.02, every document relevant to any matter in, an, in issue, in an action, that is or has been in the possession, control, or power of a party to the action, shall be disclosed as provided in these rules and, and you don't need to worry about privilege for the moment. So disclosure means uh, letting, telling other parties that a document exists, right? Letting them know of the existence or former existence in some cases of a document. So uh, the poll question, I won't uh, give no one here with me. I won't um, actually stop for you to do this, but uh, but the question you might want to think about uh, is whether an email is uh, is a document. So maybe for your own uh, amusement and edification, you can pause the video here if you want and and think and perhaps uh, uh, write a note about whether an email would be a, a document within the definition of Rule 30.02. And the answer is yes, 
because um, you'll see here, this is uh, 30.01 sub A defines document in a very expansive way to include all these things, including electronic information in electronic form. Uh, a phone call, what about a phone call? Well, a phone call is not a document because it's not any of these things. But a phone call, uh, first of all, uh, if it creates any kind of electronic record, like there's a voicemail or a recording of a phone call or a transcript of a phone call, those obviously would be included within this definition of document. If a phone call occurred and there was no record created of it, that in of itself is not a document. But the fact of that phone call and the contents of that phone call, if relevant to the matter and issue, will be discoverable through uh, oral discovery, which we're going to talk about uh, next week. Okay, um, another question that comes up, what if there's a document that uh, your client has that's relevant, um, or they had it at one point, but they no longer have that document? Is that then covered by Rule 30? And the answer is yes, uh, according to 30.01 sub 1 sub B. A document is deemed to be, oh, sorry, that's not the rule I wanted, um, um, has been. Sorry, that's what I, what I was looking for. Uh, this one here, right? Uh, the document is relevant if it is or has been uh, in the possession and control or power of your party. Meaning that if there was something that, that your client had that was relevant and doesn't anymore, but it would. They, they did at one point, then that uh, is subject to this disclosure obligation. Okay, and um, as for documents that, uh, that your client doesn't have but they could obtain, those are caught by this rule here, right? It's in the party's power if the party is entitled to obtain the original document or a copy of it, and the party seeking it is not so entitled. So um, an example for this, uh, if you are litigating against someone else in this class, right? So let's say you've got, you've got a contract with someone to be your study buddy for uh, civil procedure, right? And they, uh, one of the terms of your contract with them was that they were supposed to provide you with uh, notes, cans, before um, the second quiz in the course. And, uh, and and you allege that they, they breached that contract. So uh, so the syllabus for this course would be a relevant document, right? Um, because the syllabus says when the when the quiz is. Uh, if you both um, are are members of the course, then you both have access to the Blackboard site, and the syllabus is on the Blackboard site. So uh, so you would both be um, able or entitled to access that document. Therefore, that document would not be deemed to be in your party, in your, in, uh, in your power and control, and would not be subject to this disclosure obligation. If conversely, your study buddy was not actually in this course and didn't have access to the Blackboard site, then, and you did, and the syllabus were relevant, then you would be required to, uh, to disclose it. So, so this rule often also comes up in cases, um, uh, so like in a personal injury case, if uh, a party, a plaintiff in a personal injury case um, could get a medical record from their own doctor, were they to ask the doctor, then that would be, be relevant and subject to this disclosure obligation, right? Because the if a, if a plaintiff is suing a defendant insurance company, the defendant would not have the right to get medical documents from the plaintiff's own personal doctors, right? Because those are confidential between the doctor and the patient. But the patient, who is now the plaintiff, would have the right to access those. And, uh, and in so doing, uh, and if it's relevant, then, then they would be required to do so. Okay, so that's, um, that's disclosure. The disclosure rule, 30.02. And 30, disclosure, as I say, is, is letting other parties know that a document exists. 30.02 sub 2 is about production. Production means actually making that document available to the other parties. So in a case with a small number of documents, production means literally delivering them to the, to the other parties. 
uh, 30 years ago, that would necessarily be a, a paper copy. Today, it might mean uh, giving them access to a Dropbox folder or, or, or just emailing the documents if there's not very many of them. In other cases, cases with much larger quantities of documents, it may not actually mean doing that, but it means it always means making available. And production is something that parties are expected to do uh, in a cooperative way, right? So, uh, so if there's a hundred thousand boxes of documents in a case, as there sometimes are, and uh, you know your client has a production obligation for those documents. Um, and they choose to print them all out in 100,000 boxes and leave them on the defendant's lawn, then the court will uh, punish your client with uh, an adverse costs award. You're expected to communicate and cooperate in, uh, in, in arranging production in a reasonable manner that works for, uh, for all relevant parties. Okay, so you had a couple of um, participation questions on this. Uh, just to get at the definitions of these uh, of these words, and um, um, so disclosure is uh, is this one here, right? Um, to let the other parties know that the document exists, and then production is uh, actually making the document available to other parties. Okay. So, uh, so what it comes down to is you have to disclose the existence of every relevant document and you have to make available to the other parties every document that you have um, that's physically capable of being, being produced, um, except those over which privilege is claimed. And privilege we'll get to next week, but uh, the sh short explanation of this for today's purposes is that privilege uh, is any one of a number of, of reasons that the law accepts as legitimate for preventing the production of a document that would otherwise be relevant. So the classic example of privilege that you may be familiar with is lawyer-client privilege, solicitor-client privilege, which uh, holds that communications between a lawyer and his or her client are confidential and cannot be um, compelled to be, to be disclosed to anyone else. Uh, but then there's other categories of, uh, of privilege as well. So absent a legitimate claim of privilege, you have to disclose, your client has to disclose um, every document, including those, every relevant document, including those which are damaging to their own case, right? And, uh, and, and your job as a lawyer with regard to discovery of documents is to help your client identify the relevant documents, uh, facilitate the production of them. Um, and as we'll see, that's kind of an ethical duty you have as an officer of the court. Okay, so um, so let's talk about these. This is kind of a, an effort to visualize how this discovery and production thing works and how these break down. Um, so you can think of this as a lawyer uh, maybe having a bad day because he's got um, a billion client documents that he's trying to organize for the purpose of complying with Rule 30. And you uh, sort them, you sort documents, right, into uh, four categories. First of all, the documents which are not relevant, which will have no further use in, uh, in this, this litigation. And we'll get to the test for relevance in a second. The second pile is documents which are relevant but not privileged, so documents over which your client has, has no legitimate basis to, uh, to, to claim privilege, to claim, claim privacy over those. The third pile is documents that are relevant but are privileged, so there is a way to make uh, that type of claim. And finally, documents which are relevant but no longer in the possession, control, or power of your client. So these may be documents that have um, been inadvertently destroyed or someone took them away from your client um, or, or something of those nature, but they were, when they existed, relevant. Okay, uh, so you had a question about this, right? Where you, um, in the participation question, is this hotspot thing where you're supposed to kind of click uh, in the right area, but uh, but here's, uh, here's the answer. So the first one was click on a stack of documents that do not need to be disclosed to the other parties. And that would be, this is what I was looking for. It's only 
irrelevant documents that need not be disclosed to the other parties. You have to let them know about every relevant document, regardless of privilege or control and possession. The second question was, click on the title of a stack of document that must be produced to the other parties. So these ones you cannot produce because you do not have them. It's physically impossible to produce them. These ones you do not produce because uh, you, they're privileged. So you have, as we'll see, a, a basis the law considers legitimate to withhold them from production. These ones you do not produce because that would be a dick move. Uh, the client, the, uh, the other parties have no interest in seeing your irrelevant documents. These are the ones that you produce. Relevant, not privileged, and in the possession, control, or power of your client. Okay, so uh, we now come to Rule 30.03, which tells us, gives us the mechanism, the procedure by which you actually fulfill this disclosure obligation. And you do so uh, through an affidavit. An affidavit, as people hopefully remember from last week, uh, is subject to Rule 4.06. Affidavit is a written piece of evidence where a, um, an individual uh, basically says what they know that, that's relevant to a lawsuit. Um, an affidavit, the best type of affidavit, people hopefully recall, is the personal knowledge affidavit where the deponent um, uh, talks about things they've actually witnessed or uh, experienced with their own senses. And then second best is the affidavit on, um, on, on knowledge and belief um, where, where they talk about what, what they know. We looked at the affidavit um, from, the, from the Gomeshi versus uh, CBC case. Okay, so this is a, is a special kind of affidavit, uh, an affidavit of documents. Um, where the party serves on every other party an affidavit of documents disclosing to the full extent of the party's knowledge, information, and belief all documents relevant to any matter and issue in the action that are or have been in the party's possession, control, or power. So, uh, so if you are personal, personally involved in litigation, your personal capacity, this would be the documents that you that you know of that you've dealt with in your. Uh, in your day-to-day -day life, which pass this relevance test. And again, we'll get to the relevance test in a second. Or affidavits of documents are also often sworn by executives from corporate litigants. So if you're uh, the vice president or, or, um, or responsible manager of a company which is involved in litigation, you would be expected to search with your lawyer's assistance through uh, your corporation's documents, identify those which pass the relevance test, and list them in this affidavit of documents. Okay, so uh, so the affidavit of documents is accompanied by these schedules, which are described in Rule 30.03 sub 2, um, a schedule first showing all documents that are actually in the party's possession, control, or power that you do not object to producing, which you're going to have to actually produce. Um, schedule B, those that were in the possession, control, or power over which a privilege is claimed. Um, schedule C, those that are no longer in the party's possession, control, or power. Uh, together with a statement of when and how the party lost possession or control or power of those documents and their present location. So, uh, so, so Schedule C, this um, is not, doesn't occur in every affidavit of documents, but it will be there if there's some documents that your client acknowledges are relevant, but they can't, they say they don't, we don't have them anymore. And you got to say why, right? Because, you know, this, the subtext of all of this is that parties are expected to disclose, are required, legally required to disclose and produce documents that damage their interests, right, which undermine their legal case. And so if you say, oh, I used to have this document that would have really helped you guys, but it seems to be gone, um, you got to say why, right? And, you know, um, it's not a good answer to say, you know, because I shredded it, so you wouldn't have to have it. If you do that, you'll be 
uh, probably in contempt of court and definitely punished um, through costs. So, uh, so, so, so if you're going to make this claim that you've lost something, you've got to say why and how. Okay, so uh, so here is an example. Um, okay, so 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 this um, uh, basically maps onto our stacks, right? Your affidavit of documents um, uh, maps like this, right? Schedule A is going to be relevant, not privileged. Schedule B, relevant and privileged. Schedule C, um, relevant, no longer in control, possession or power. And don't bother putting any of these. Don't listen. And don't list any of these in your uh, affidavit of documents. So here is a page from a real schedule to a real affidavit of documents. Um, I don't know if you want to pause the video and, and see if you can figure out which schedule this would have appeared in. The answer is Schedule B because we have grounds of privilege being claimed here. Uh, so um, uh, this, this would be documents where the party is saying I should not have to produce these. And you see that you have to list the ground of privilege because grounds of privilege can be contested. That's what next week's cases are, are, are largely about. Um, so the party has to have the opportunity to say, uh, look, that's not a legitimate claim of privilege. And then you have a motion and, uh, and fight it out. Okay, so uh, so as I said, um, this is supposed to be a voluntary cooperative process in which parties will at times uh, disclose, have to disclose things which help their adversaries. And so we have some rules here which are meant to kind of uh, reinforce that and increase the likelihood that that will actually happen. 30.03 sub 3, the affidavit must contain a statement that the party has never had in the party's possession, control, or power, any document relevant to any matter and issue in the action other than those in the affidavit, right? So if a party's thinking of um, kind of welching on this obligation and just sort of, oh, having to accidentally forget conveniently to let you know about this document that would have really helped you, my adversary, this is supposed to reduce that because they've got to swear. Remember, affidavits are sworn. You've got to, you've got to swear solemnly swear before um before a third party that what you've uh, the contents of your of your um affidavit are true uh, and you have to swear that this is it. there's nothing else i'm leaving out then we have 30.03 sub 4 um which uh, which is meant to further increase the likelihood that uh, that these um, affidavits will be complete, right? Um, and uh, that says that the lawyer, where the party is represented by a lawyer, the lawyer has to also certify that he or she has explained to the deponent the necessity of making full disclosure, full documents relevant to any matter and issue of the action, and what kinds of documents are likely to be relevant to the allegations made in the pleadings. So, so this, um, when, you, when you do this, when you have this conversation as a lawyer with your client, you are acting as an officer of the court, right? So, so most of what you do in civil litigation is about advancing your client's interests. That's what lawyers do. They were retained and we take instructions from clients in order to advance their interests in accordance with the law. This conversation is not like that. This is a conversation where you have to say, uh, look, you really have to disclose everything, even if it helps the other side. Um, and I'm going to help you figure out what's relevant, um, but, but that's, uh, that's your obligation. And, um, uh, so this, and the lawyer has to then certify uh, and then put their signature to the fact that they did so, and it's found that they didn't, then they'll be, they'll be in trouble not only in trouble with the judge presiding over the civil action, but also in trouble with the law society. Under rule of professional conduct, 5.1-3.1 uh, sub A sub I, wherever a lawyer is subject to rules, like these rules of civil procedure, requiring parties to produce documents, 
Uh, you have to explain to your client the necessity of making full disclosure of all documents related to any matter and issue and assisting the client in fulfilling his or her obligations to, uh, to do so. Uh, so that's there to, to add some extra uh, weight and some extra bad consequences if you as a lawyer fail to do so. And this is all here because because um, this is this disclosure obligation is a tough pill to swallow, right? Um, it's it's litigants are surprised when you tell them that they have to disclose everything, including things that help their adversaries, especially in the case of litigants who are commercial rivals, right? So uh, you know we talked about the Apple and Samsung litigation going on for decades. Now, Apple and Samsung are, you know, bitter commercial rivals used to keeping uh, everything that they have secret from each other. When they become involved in litigation, they become subject to a disclosure obligation. Um, so that's kind of a tough conversation to have with the client to, to tell them they have to do that. Um, one of the things that kind of sweetens the pill, perhaps, if you can get them to think this way, is that, uh, is that this is obviously a reciprocal obligation. So their adversaries in litigation are equally required to disclose to your client everything that is relevant, including things that will help your client's case against their adversaries. So if the system works and if everyone does what they're supposed to, uh, then it's cheaper um, and easier than it would be if we had a less, um, a less voluntary uh, disclosure regime, which is to say a regime requiring more, more motions. Okay, so uh, so when you are having this conversation, and in, with regards to disclosure, you're an officer of the court, not uh, not an advocate so much. Um, however, when you're discussing disclosure with your client before litigation, then it certainly is appropriate for you to call your client's attention to the fact that if they litigate, they choose to commence a lawsuit, or if they uh, pass up an opportunity to settle and thereby continue into civil litigation, they will become subject to the disclosure obligation. And desire to avoid, avoid the disclosure obligation is a legitimate reason to avoid civil litigation in the first place, right? So very often when people get into lawsuits, they had alternatives, right? They could have settled, they could have avoided suing in the first place, um, they, and so forth, right? So, uh, so, so when you have a conversation with your client before about whether to start a lawsuit, uh, it's entirely appropriate for you as an advocate to let them know that if they do choose to proceed down this road, um, that one of the consequences of doing so is the disclosure obligation which is something that people find unpleasant about civil litigation along with the time and the money and the aggravation uh, and so forth. Okay, so one other rule to point out before we move on is 30.07. So this is where you come across something later, right? Um, either because it, it's delivered to your client after they've sworn their original affidavit of documents, or they missed it in their, in their first search. Um, uh, in whatever way it comes to your client's attention, uh, to a party's attention that they have such a document, um, they have to serve um, a supplementary affidavit specifying all the new documents, right? So, uh, so that the other parties have to be kept up to date on uh, on what you have that's relevant. Okay, and we'll get to uh, the 30.06 and 30.08 in a bit. First, we need to talk about what relevance is, right? We keep on talking about relevant documents. What, what, what does it mean to say that a document is relevant? So that's where our Peter Kiewit case comes in. Uh, the case defines relevance um, and also illustrates how this principle of proportionality can uh, can act to uh, to restrict to constrain the the quantity of documents that have to be disclosed. 
Okay, so this um, dispute arose from a complex uh, construction project in British Columbia to build a humongous transmission line, right, with all these, um, you know, hydro poles, um, like halfway across BC to bring electricity from this humongous dam to, uh, to the lower mainland where the electricity was needed, uh, the Mica Creek transmission line. So Peter Kiewit was the construction company building these lines for BC Hydro. Uh, but what made this deal a little bit unusual was that BC Hydro was actually providing the steel that Kiewit was going to use to, to build this. So the project went off the rails, uh, didn't get built on time or on budget. Um, Kiewit says that the steel was to blame. BC Hydro was actually to blame because they failed to provide the steel that they were supposed to under the contract. So litigation begins. BC Hydro uh, is subject to a disclosure obligation, very similar to Ontario's Rule 30. Uh, and at paragraph 12 of the judgment, Kiewit says, we want, uh, we want contracts, we want documents from other contracts that BC had, Hydro had with other um, construction companies and other uh, contractors who are not parties to this litigation. So uh, production inspection of documents relating to this and other contracts which are underway at the same time as the contracting. So I'm not sure if people were able to figure this out, why it is that the Kiewit actually wanted these, um, these documents uh, relating to hydro, BC Hydro's relations with non-parties. Um, it comes out in paragraph five, right, where they talk about this squeaky contractor getting the steel. So this is a theory that Peter Kiewit has advanced in its pleadings about why BC Hydro failed to provide the steel that, uh, that, that Peter Kiewit needed. And they say basically there was a, a limited supply of steel and there were other contractors doing similar projects for BC Hydro who also wanted the steel. And um, BC Hydro gave it to them instead because uh, this is based on you know, the, the saying, the squeaky wheel gets the, uh, gets the grease, right? Likewise here they're saying other contractors were squeaking more loudly, but were more demanding. So BC Hydro gave them the steel to shut them up, which meant we didn't have it. And that's why we screwed up the construction project. Okay, so, um, so that's why they say these documents are relevant because they say uh, documents about BC Hydro's communications with other parties will, can, can, may um, be evidence for this theory that we that we're, what we ran with in our pleadings. Okay, so why does BC Hydro object to producing those documents? It's not a privilege claim. Um, it's basically they say this is way too much stuff for us to go through. Right? They say we've already uh, given you 30,000 documents um, for, for inspection. Um, and plus, we gave uh, another 12 page list of documents. So, right, it's basically a supplementary affidavit of documents, the BC version of that, uh, listing other documents that we're prepared to, to, to make available. Uh, and for BC Hydro says for us to comply with what he was asking for here would require. Uh, searching through mountains of documents. It's going to take us a lot of time. Our executives are going to be uh, run ragged having to go through um, all this stuff, trying to get everything that you said you wanted. Okay, so that's kind of the positions of the parties. So how does the court uh, decide this case? Well, they have to start with the question of what is relevant. Um, and, and this is still a very important point of law for us today. Um, they get into this uh, paragraph 14 extended uh, discussion of this case, um, what's known as the Peruvian guano case, uh, which may sound like just a bunch of South American bird droppings, but it actually, Peruvian guano, is still the, uh, the leading case and still gives us our definition of what relevance is, right? So, so what what documents are relevant to a particular uh, to a particular civil action, and everything hinges on that, right? Because Rule 30 
um, only pertains to relevant documents. So we really have to know what, what relevance is. So, you know, a very narrow conception of relevance in this case would be that, you know, only the documents which pertain to the actual commercial relationship in question are relevant, which is to say the contract between Kiwit and BC Hydro, communications between BC and Hydro, etc. cetera. Uh, a far broader conception of relevance would be that any document BC Hydro created, um, you know, during the time it was working with, with Peter Kiewit, uh is relevant because BC Hydro is a defendant. So we basically need to see everything that they, they produced. And BC Hydro, you recall, is the largest corporation in uh, BC at the time. Okay, so narrow would be too narrow, broad would be too narrow. What is our sort of happy medium? Well, the definition of relevance comes um, here at uh, paragraph 18. Every document relates to the matters in question and the action is to say is relevant to the matters in question in the action, which not only would be evidence upon any issue, but also which it is reasonable to suppose contains information which may, not which must, either directly or indirectly enable the party requiring the affidavit either to advance his own case or to damage the case of his adversary. So what this means is that something is relevant if it might help another party in the litigation. And to determine whether a certain document might help a party in the litigation, we refer to the pleadings, right? The pleadings are where all the parties lay out their theory or theories of the case, right? You will recall that pleadings can have alternative pleadings. Um, so there might be multiple routes uh, for a party to get to the legal outcome it wants. If a certain document could potentially, if the case works, develops in a certain way, help that party, then it is relevant. We don't have to show that it would work as evidence right now. Okay, so how does Peter Kiewit do on this test? Uh, well, if we look at paragraph 20, we see that um, they basically pass the proving guano test, right? A literal reading of, of Rule 26, their version of documentary disclosure, and the application of the proving guano case leads inexorably to the conclusion that the plaintiffs should succeed on this application. So, Kiewit's going to win, right? No, they're not going to win. Uh, because of the a number of documents involved, right? I respectfully decline to follow the proving Guano case. Uh, in situations like this, where there are thousands or possibly hundreds of thousands of documents of only possible relevance uh, in, in question. Um, so the key takeaway here is that documentary production obligations will be limited by the proportionality principle. Proportionality simply means that civil litigation, the obligations that civil litigation imposes on people are supposed to be proportionate to what is at stake. And the nightmare of the civil litigation system is the Pyrrhic victory, right? Which we talked about at the very beginning where, uh, where someone succeeds in law but the amount of time and money and aggravation that they had to uh, go through to get there um, exceeds the value of what they were fighting over. And this can easily happen, right? Once you start on a, start on a search for truth and you are um, scrupulously careful at every turn to be fair, to follow the Audi Altair and Parton rule, it can very quickly get so expensive that the whole shooting match um, is disproportionate to, uh, to, to, to what you're, what's at stake. And it's not just we don't want to keep costs below the amount that's being argued over. We would ideally want it to be well below, right? I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty lousy thing for the system as a whole if in order to assert your absolute ironclad legal rights to $50,000, you have to spend $40,000, right? Ideally, the total cost should be should be well below the significance of what's at issue. And if we want that to be true, then we really got to restrict discovery. Because discovery is where um, a huge chunk of the, the money involved in civil litigation is spent. 
right? It's, you know, relatively, it's not that expensive, um, all things considered, to, uh, to get a lawyer to draft pleadings for you, right? If you, want, if you want a statement of claim drafted, go to the lawyer's office, you tell them what happened, you tell them the story, um, you know, they think a little bit about what law applies, they probably don't have to think much about it if they're an experienced lawyer, um, the lawyer or an associate bangs out a, uh, a state of draft statement of claim, you look it over, um, you know, it's uh, sort of a discreet, and those of you who are drafting pleadings know that it's uh, it can be done in a certain kind of predictable period of time. Discovery, right? Discovery is expensive because it's so time consuming and because it's such an open-ended uh, time suck, right? You've got to, uh, you, you've got to, search through, in the case of corporate litigant, potentially a, a humongous um, bottomless pit of documents they've generated, and you don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, and, and if you send like high-priced lawyers, or even better, uh, a team of multiple people billing three or $400 an hour into that, um, it can escalate costs very, very quickly. So, so proportionality here limits the disclosure obligation of, uh, of BC Hydro. And um, they're going to, uh, so what they're going to try to do in, in adjudicating this procedural motion is, uh, is find a way to, uh, to, to balance the interest in more fulsome disclosure right and the, the search for truth and the plaintiff's unquestioned entitlement uh, to get at the, the, the facts that are going to going to reveal what actually happened balance that against the proportionality principle so how are we going to do that and that's done by judges hearing these motions on a case-by-case -case, um, basis right you sort of try to craft uh, when they're doing their job properly they try to craft um, a solution which which balances those things uh, as well as possible. Um, okay, so so what do they do? They at paragraph twenty four they uh, they spitball a few ideas, right? Um, uh, one solution would be to permit the most extensive possible search and inquiry to be made at the plaintiff's non recoverable expense, right? That is to say, BC Hydro is going to have to um, you know search through all of its stuff, but Peter Kiewit's going to pay. For that, right, they're going to pay the BC Hydro's lawyers' cost to do that. Or alternatively, to require the plaintiffs to post security for, for the cost of the search, right, which is to say that, um, uh, you know, Kiewit's going to would have to promise that we will pay if the search does not uncover anything, right. But if the search does uncover um, relevant documents, then then BC Hydro is going to have to eat the cost, right. Another idea they they uh, they kind of brainstorming here. A third idea, another suggestion might be to try an issue, if one could be defined, which might resolve the question without the kind of search which the plaintiff's motion requires. Okay, so what does this mean, trying an issue? To try an issue is to identify one part, one legal issue arising from the pleadings, um, which can be hived off from the rest of the case and uh, and subjected to adjudication by itself, right? So as we know from looking at pleadings, very often there'll be multiple issues between the same parties. Uh, and because of alternative pleadings, a party will have uh, multiple routes that they're offering the court to sort of get to the same outcome that they want. So if that's the case, uh, and if one of those issues could be adjudicated with minimal documentary disclosure, then the idea is let's see if we can resolve the whole case on that basis before we spend the time and money um, uh, obtaining disclosure for, uh, for, for the other issues that require much more disclosure. Okay. Uh, so there might be, um, you know, in this case, there might be, just coming back to trying an issue, there might, we've got the squeaky contractor theory, right? So, so that's one of the things Peter Kewitt has claimed. Is to, to adjudicate the squeaky contractor theory would require enormous documentary disclosure from BC Hydro, because determining whether or not that's true requires looking at all the communications that BC Hydro had with all of its other contractors to see whether they were, um, in fact, 
so much more demanding with the with the steel requirements that they took the steel that Q was supposed to have. But Kiewit might have another theory. They might have another reason about why they should win. Uh, like, you know, um, uh, BC Hydro uh, never, um, uh, they never even tried to provide the steel or, uh, or the steel they, they did provide was, was um, subgrade. Or, you know, even if we had, did have the steel, BC Hydro's, uh, you know, construction crews uh, kept on, driving, you know, in their big noisy trucks doing donuts around our guys so we couldn't build the, the transmission line anyway, right? The Q might have another set of, another reason why they think they should win, and that reason might require less documentary disclosure. So let's try that issue, and maybe we can figure it out that way. That's not right. That's just an idea they spitball, paragraph 25. Uh, what they ultimately decide to do is something different. They say the plaintiffs must choose a smaller target within BC Hydro, right? This is the largest enterprise in the province. They need to say, um, uh, like, for example, specify which contractors do you think, um, does Peter, does Peter Kiewit think were getting our steel? Which were these, who were these squeaky contractors? It would be a smaller target, a more reasonable target for, to say, BC Hydro, you've got to dig up the, um, the contracts with with these specific um, um, contractors, right? And we'll look at those. That's a smaller target. And not only do they have to have a smaller target, they must also establish a prima facie case that something relevant will be uncovered before a further affidavit and further inspection will be ordered. So because of the expense we're going to, we're trying to put BC Hydro to here, uh, there has to be something more than just the theory in your pleadings, right? We need a bit of evidence, Peter Kiewit, uh, that there's something to this squeaky contractor theory. Because the requirement to put the evidence forward reduces the likelihood that this expense of the search will be wasted, right? Um, and it, uh, it makes it more likely that they... BC Hydro will will dig up and uh, and produce something relevant if they do so. Okay, so so far BC Hydro seems to be winning here, but um, not entirely, right? Because they also say if Kiwit does come forward with a smaller target and prima facie evidence that there's something relevant that's missing, I would expect a senior responsible officer of BC Hydro to verify on oath the extent of its production to date, the magnitude and estimated extent of the search required to satisfy the further production on which which is being sought and such further circumstances as which as may be necessary to enable the court to decide whether a further search will be fruitful so uh, so, so basically uh, you know ubc hydro we need to we need to be sure that you really are doing this in good faith uh, and you need to um, satisfy the court that you have um, you know undertaken a, a, a sufficiently exhaustive search so far. And if you're going to run this proportionality defense that, you know, doing more would cost so much that it's not worth it, um, you need to give us some evidence of that, right? Uh, and, and once you guys come back with all that stuff, we're going to try to issue an order which balances um, uh, these, two, these two objectives we're trying to pursue. So um, paragraph 28, uh, the court is apparently worried about the precedent, right? Um, I hesitate to make pronouncements such as this, which carry the risk of being misunderstood. They do not want uh, parties to civil litigation to go around waving Peter Kiewit to, to, to say that we don't have to, we don't have to disclose, um, we don't have to search for relevant documents because uh, it takes time and money. That's not going to fly, except in cases um, uh, with humongous, humongous numbers of documents, right? Um, BC Hydro hasn't done anything wrong, um, and, um, and and this this business of letting proportionality limit the discovery obligation applies uh, only to cases with huge, uh, huge numbers of documents. Um, okay. So, so, so the so the takeaway from here. So, what they, the the specific remedy the court crafted here is 
is um, uh, not going to be something they'll do every time. Like each case will be different, and we'll see uh, what Lacalamita and uh, McCarthy do with this same sim similar type of issue. So the, the takeaway from this case is not that you know every court's going to do this specific thing to do here. The takeaway is first of all the Peruvian guano test. And secondly, the idea that proportionality limits um, discovery obligations in cases with large numbers of documents uh, and a potentially very expensive search. And um, uh, perhaps third, you know, thirdly, that in cases like this, the court's remedy is going to try to balance um, the, the, the competing objectives that we've, uh, we've just talked about. Okay, so this was uh, 1982, right? A pretty early um, but influential statement of this uh, this idea of proportionality and discovery. Um, it subsequently was really kind of taken up by the civil procedure community. Um, so we now have um, a proportionality principle right at the beginning of the rules of civil procedure in the interpretation section. So as you may know from studying statutory interpretation, when something is right up at the front and listed as kind of an interpretive principle. Uh, it's meant to uh, to influence the way the court applies all of the other provisions in the statute, or in this case, uh, the regulation, the rules of civil procedure. And one of these is proportionality. In applying these rules, the court shall make orders and give directions that are proportionate to the importance and complexity of the issues and the amount involved in the proceeding. Um, and so that applies to everything. Uh, this was considered so important that they actually put in a special rule about proportionality in discovery. Uh, that when you're trying to decide whether someone has to produce a document or answer a question, that's oral discovery, um, the court takes into account all these things, right? The time, the expense, um, um, the, the prejudice. Remember, prejudice is just unfair advantage applied to a party. Um, and, uh, and whether there's a better way um, to get that, get this stuff, right? So, so definitely if Kiewit has um, another way to get the information and documents they want, um, we definitely don't want to be putting BCI to that expense. And we certainly, certainly don't want um, litigants trying to impose uh, onerous discovery obligations on each other for, for strategic purposes. Right, because we know we know from um, we talked about this in the first class, right? That uh, that the expense of litigation when you've got something um, that's expensive and onerous, uh, and you've got parties who are adversaries who are in many cases trying to grind each other into the dirt, they uh, there's a there's a risk that they can use procedural mechanisms to uh, to try to pressure each other into dropping out or settling. Right, so so it's not unheard of for a party to bring a motion seeking further disclosure, um, perhaps knowing either in the back of their head or or quite consciously that doing so will threaten the other side with the huge cost of complying with disclosure, um, and and we definitely don't want uh, don't want the system used in that way. Um, and finally, the overall volume of documents um, um, is is relevant. Right, we got to think about. Um, how many um, how many pieces of paper or, or in this day and age as we'll see electronic records uh, we're talking about that's going to be relevant. Okay. So at this point, um, I wanted to uh, to show you um, this little video, right? I forgot to just get it uh, queued up here. Um, but uh, this is a video about, uh, which explains e-discovery, right? Um, and I, I sent you the email with it, so you can watch it um, if you want uh, in a separate window based on, by clicking the link in your, um, in your uh, email that I sent. Uh, so we'll run it through here, and I, it, should, it should work so you can watch it through the virtual classroom if, uh, as well. Uh, so what, what is this? This is, um, uh, it kind of explains how uh, this concept of discovery and how uh, the, the relevance test and how the obligation to search for documents um, plays out in this day and age when 
corporations in particular have vast troves of, uh, of electronic information which comply with the rules definition of, of documents. And it talks about how, how that works in litigation uh, and how, uh, how companies can kind of plan to, to minimize that expense. We'll just watch the first six and a half minutes. At the six and a half minute mark, uh, it becomes something else that you don't have to watch. When people or companies sue each other, they go through a process called discovery where they trade information about the case. Each side asks the other side to produce information that's relevant to the case. For the past few hundred years, discovery has mostly been done using paper. It was not uncommon for companies to have warehouses filled with boxes and boxes of files. But since the dawn of the computer age, most data is now stored electronically. The courts have recognized this shift in information storage and have expanded the discovery process to include electronic data. Finding, collecting, and producing electronic data during litigation is known as electronic discovery or e-discovery. There are, however, a lot of problems associated with the discovery process. For example, whereas paper is always just paper, electronically stored information, or ESI, can come in a myriad of different formats like word processing documents, spreadsheets, email messages, databases, sound recordings, videos, and many others. Just to give some perspective on the volume of information we're dealing with, consider this. At least 90% of corporate communication is done by email. Many email messages also have attachments. These email messages and their attachments are stored in a lot of different places, on people's computers, on company servers, on cell phones, and on backup tapes. So what happens when you get sued and have to find this information in a complex IT system? If your company isn't ready for e-discovery, this can be an extremely costly and time-consuming experience. Now let's take a closer look at the steps in the e-discovery process and see how quickly the cost can mount. The first step in the e-discovery process is identification. In this step, the company locates any sources of electronically stored information that might be relevant to the case and figures out how to collect it. Please notice the downward sloping triangle on the left labeled volume. This triangle shows how the quantity of information decreases as the e-discovery process moves forward. The second step in the process is preservation. Here the company makes sure that its ESI is protected from being changed or deleted while the lawsuit is going on. This can be a huge challenge since employees rely on their data to work. A company can't just stop using its files until the lawsuit is over. Once the company has identified and preserved the relevant data, it's time to move on to the collection step where the company gathers all the ESI related to the case. After the ESI has been collected, the next step is processing. In this step, the volume of ESI is reduced by removing duplicate and irrelevant information. For example, email chains that contain the same messages twice or duplicate documents that were saved on more than one computer. The data set is searched using keywords and concepts that are relevant to the case. Files may also be converted to different formats that are more suitable for the next steps in the process. Notice the upward sloping triangle on the right labeled relevance. This shows how the debt becomes more relevant as it moves through the process. Now we move on to the next step, review. Here the company's law firm reads through ESI that's been collected and processed to make sure that it's relevant and that none of it is considered private or privileged communication between the company and its lawyers. Analysis is an important step in this process. As data is being processed and reviewed, the company learns more about the data collected, tweaking its process to find only the most relevant information. Once the information has been collected, reviewed, and analyzed, it's ready for production. At this point, the company delivers the final and most relevant ESI to the opposing counsel. If the case goes to trial, or if information is used during other court proceedings, lawyers may be responsible for presentation. This is where the attorneys display the relevant evidence in a clear and concise format to support their arguments. So now that we've discussed the e-discovery process, try to imagine how it would affect the following hypothetical case. Engineering Incorporated, or EI, is a mid-sized engineering firm that recently fired one of its employees on suspicion of theft of trade secrets. The company hired an industrial security firm to investigate the theft, and they found computer logs that showed the employee accessing the stolen information from a company computer, video evidence from a hidden camera pointed at the computer, RFID data from the computer room's keycard access system, GPS information from a tracking device located on the employee's company car, and text message information from the employee's company cell phone. But the suspected employee denies the company's accusations and has countersued for wrongful termination. As part of the discovery process, the company is required to locate and produce all the electronic evidence gathered by all of its systems. 
Unfortunately, the company has no data management processes or policies in place, and as a result, the requested information is haphazardly organized and stored. Now the company has to ask several employees in the IT department to spend time locating and collecting the required evidence. As time goes on, the cost of this process increases and productivity decreases because now these employees are not doing their normal jobs. Once all of the information has been collected and processed, the company's law firm bills the company hundreds of dollars per hour for its lawyers to review all the information before it's produced to the other side. As one could imagine, this step is the most expensive part of the e-discovery process. Once all the necessary information is produced and the final costs are totaled, it's clear that the company could have saved a ton of money by taking preventative steps to organize their data instead of wading through its disorganized IT system. It's also important to realize that you don't have to be sued directly to be dragged into an e-discovery situation. Third-party companies such as the industrial security firm that provided services to catch the employee in the hypothetical situation will also be subject to the e-discovery process. If this firm doesn't have a highly organized data management system, it will also feel the financial pain of e-discovery. Companies should understand that e-discovery doesn't have to be expensive and painful. Being proactive can greatly decrease the cost and complexity of an organization's lawsuits. In addition to decreasing the cost of litigation, a proactive data management strategy helps to organize and classify records, creating tremendous cost-saving opportunities. Because employees can find information faster, their productivity increases. Because the company is storing less information, its storage costs decrease. For better or worse, e-discovery is here to stay. Companies have two choices. They can wise up to the benefits of preventative e-discovery, or they can find out about them the hard way during litigation. A company that is proactive will save a lot of time and money. A company that keeps its head in the sand faces a real potential for financial ruin. Okay, so don't, uh, don't be that guy with your head in the sand. And you probably will not be surprised to hear that the next thing that comes in that video is a pitch for this company, which uh, sells this data management service. They didn't uh, spend all that time with whiteboards just out of the goodness of their hearts. Okay, so, uh, so, so why don't we watch that? Just to sort of give you a sense of how uh, this looks from the corporate point of view uh, and how, you know, obviously, the number of relevant documents has been multiplied by um, by the sort of switch to to digital uh, digital practice in uh, in the corporate world. Um, it's also kind of uh, shows hopefully why one of the reasons why this uh, why this case why this course is mandatory for uh, even those of you who will not end up engaged in civil litigation because if you end up in a corporate practice right if you are a general counsel for a small corporation or a municipality or something like that, uh, you need to be aware of what the discovery obligations of your client will be, right? And kind of the point of the video is that if you sort of uh, give advice to your corporate client about how to arrange its IT systems, then that can minimize the expense to which, uh, which your client will be exposed if and when they are sued and become subject to, to discovery obligations. So, uh, so let's look at a few more rules here. The deemed undertaking rule uh, is, uh, is important, right? So this uh, was in your readings, the rule 30.1.01 uh, sub 3. All parties and their lawyers are deemed to undertake not to use evidence or information to which this rule applies for any purposes other than those of the proceeding in which the evidence was obtained. So, uh, so what does that mean? It means that uh, discovery will often, uh, especially in cases with personal litigants, will uh, reveal um, some, some information which may be sensitive or, or private. Uh, or even with corporate litigants, right? Um, you know, Apple and Samsung. If uh, Samsung has to disclose some of their patent applications or their sort of IP in order to adjudicate that dispute, which is about intellectual property, um, that um, that information and Apple gets it is Apple's not supposed to use it to design the next iPhone. They're supposed to use it exclusively for the purposes of the litigation, right? So determining uh, the, the actual facts and applying the law to them. Uh, okay, let's turn now to rule 30.06. 
which was in uh, in your readings. Um, and that is all about uh, dispute resolution, right? So I've said uh, that uh, this process is supposed to work on a voluntary basis without the parties um, having to go to court and you become subject to this disclosure obligation, your lawyer helps you, you're supposed to just, just do it without having anyone tell you to do it. But of course, disputes do arise. And that's where uh, Rule 30.06 comes in. Uh, and uh, you read uh, an example of, uh, of this dispute resolution process being applied. Uh, and that was in the case of Leduc versus Romain. Okay, so this was an auto uh, accident case. Um, there was a car crash between Leduc and Romain. Leduc uh, was injured, says he was injured at least, and he sues uh, Janice Romain for, uh, for, um, for, for negligent driving. So he, of course, as a civil litigant, has to uh, make disclosure. He swears an affidavit of documents. The affidavit of documents does not include his Facebook page. Romain wants Leduc's complete Facebook page. Why does she want it? Well, uh, he has told his doctors that he, after the accident, is no longer able to engage in the sporting activities he had enjoyed before the accident. Uh, which will increase the damages to which he'll be entitled if true, right? He'll, um, in principle, be entitled to some compensation for his loss of enjoyment of life resulting from the accident. The defendants think, man, maybe it's not true, right? Um, we're not, um, perhaps he's not as badly injured as he says he is, right? And maybe in his Facebook page, um, he, there's some pictures of him doing something which is inconsistent with this claim right, with his pleading, uh, like maybe we'll find him water skiing um, in, in a picture um, dated after the date of the injury. So this is, uh, this sort of thing is the reason why uh, private investigators are retained by plaintiffs in, in personal injury actions, right, because they can sometimes uncover evidence which contradicts the severity of, of the injury which the plaintiff is claiming. Uh, so the, at the first level that heard this was, was the master, right, Master Dash. Master Dash says um, this is this effort to get at the Facebook page is a phishing expedition. Uh, if a judge tells you you are engaged in a phishing expedition, then you are about to lose. Um, and um, this case you read was basically the appeal of that master level decision to uh, Superior Court of Justice. Uh, okay, so it starts um, the reasoning at paragraph uh, 14, telling us something we already know, which is that the, uh, the onus for reviewing documents to determine their relevance rests in the first instance with the party bearing the obligation to produce, right? So we know that. That's the sort of voluntary, do it automatically, um, um, review your documents, disclose what's, what's, what's relevant. And of course, their lawyer, uh, the, the lawyer for the party has, uh, has a key role to play that as well, as we've seen. So that means that under Rule 30, Leduc has a clear obligation to produce anything, disclose anything relevant. If he pleads that he used to love water skiing, right, then that pleading, um, if he pleads he used to love water skiing but can't do it anymore, then that pleading makes relevant any documentary um, evidence, including photos he has about his ability to water ski or enjoy water skiing both before and after the injury. So it's all relevant and he has to disclose it. Um, and of course, uh, pictures of him water skiing before the incident, it would be in his interest to disclose if the whole argument is that he's lost his ability. Uh, pictures of him water skiing after the incident would not be in his interest to disclose, but are still entirely relevant, and the the uh, obligation is the same. Okay, so he's, we assume he's done that. We've got this dispute. The other side has brought this 30.06 motion. Um, the the the, uh, the decision tells us that if you are bringing this motion. Right, a motion under Rule 30.06 requires evidence, as opposed to mere speculation, 
that potentially relevant undisclosed documents exist, right? The moving party bears the onus on the balance of probabilities of, of proving that uh, the, an order should be granted, right? And the moving party, of course, is the defendant here. Um, however, the level of proof required should take into account the fact that one party has access to the documents and the other does not. So if you if there's like a secret folder of, of photos um, and it's private to you and you don't know what's in there, it's hard for you to prove that what's in there is, is relevant. Um, and the court is saying with this sentence that the level of proof required is going to take into account this, um, this, this reality. Um, paragraph 28 um, reiterates that Facebook photos can certainly be relevant, right? Um, there's, uh, there's, there's no reason why, why they wouldn't be. Um, and... Uh, including including private documents on, on Facebook, of course. Now, when it comes to Facebook, um, they talk about this Murphy versus Perger case, right? Which is, is basically um, a case in which uh, there was a Facebook profile, part of which was public, part of which was private. The public photos, which the defendant could see just like anyone else can see them, uh, gave rise to an inference about what would be in the private photos, right? So in uh, Leduc's case, if he's got some water skiing photos on the public part of his profile, uh, then that is evidence or gives rise to a reasonable inference that there may be further water skiing photos on uh, in the private side of his, of his profile. So that's the easy case. Uh, this, uh, or it's also relatively easy, leaving Facebook aside, in any case where there's, there's a hint, a reasonable hint, um, you know, that you, you have document X, you can see document X, and the existence of document X reasonably implies that document Y, which has not yet been disclosed or produced, exists, and therefore should have been disclosed. Um, or in, in other cases, right, where, uh, you know, if a party has disclosed um, a sort of report that their business generated, right? So uh, payroll report for, for a week of April 1st, payroll report for a week of April 8th, payroll report, report for a week of April 15th, payroll report for a week, week of April 29th. Where's the week of the 22nd, right? So that's like an, an inference from a disclosed document about the existence of a non-disclosed document, which you would use in your Rule 30.06 motion. Okay, this is a hard case, right? This is not one where we can infer anything about, about the private profile, Facebook profile, because the entire Facebook profile is private. The, the only thing you know publicly is that he's got a profile, can't see anything unless he's friended you. Um, so uh, so, so what's, what's the solution? Well, one thing the court could have done is say the entire um, uh, profile, uh, Facebook profile, it has to be disclosed, even if it's private, right? Um, uh, they don't do that. Neither court, either level of court does that um, because most of it's probably not relevant, right? And we don't want civil litigation to be uh, a pretext for, uh, for parties like sort of, you know, sifting through and violating all the privacy interests of each other um, they're, they're allowed to do so. Privacy is not a shield to disclosure, but, um, but equally documents which are not relevant um, uh, should never be disclosed and would be an infringement on, um, on privacy to do so. Okay, so, so, so what are we going to do? What's the, what's the process in cases like this? Um, what they say uh, is that if you think it might be relevant, if you think there might be something relevant that hasn't been disclosed, you need to ask questions about it in your examination for discovery. So examination for discovery is next week. That's oral discovery, a process by which uh, a party will ask questions of uh, their adversary to try to get them to, uh, to, to reveal information, um, both information which never had a documentary basis but also reveal information about potentially relevant documents not been disclosed. 
Um, so, uh, so that's uh, that. That's basically uh, what you have to do here, right? They they say we're going to use the examination for discovery process to uh, to 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 let Leduc um, give Leduc an opportunity. Sorry, give Roman and defendants an opportunity to 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 see whether they're whether we can maybe get um, Leduc to uh, to admit to acknowledge that there's something that's relevant is there. Such evidence will emerge from questions asked on a party's examination for discovery about the existence and content of the person's Facebook profile, right? So, uh, so you know, in, in the examination for discovery, you'll have the defendant's lawyer saying, um, so Mr. Leduc, I understand you have a Facebook profile. Yes, I do. Um, how long have you had that Facebook profile? Well, since like about 2013 or something. Um, and uh, do you uh, put, uh, what, what type of photos do you put on that Facebook profile? Um, what do you mean with photos? Do you have photos about your personal recreational life on the Facebook profile? Yes, I do. Um, did you ever enjoy water skiing? Yes, I did. Um, did you ever have any photos of water skiing, yourself water skiing on that Facebook profile? And he says, like, yeah, I had a whole bunch of them. Like, I, every time I went out with my bros water skiing, we'd always take a thousand pictures and put them up on Facebook, yo. Uh, and then the defendant would be like, Oh, so so you've been have you done that sort of on a regular basis um, every summer? Yeah, every summer we never miss it. So, Leduc, right? A skillful examination for discovery may lead him to acknowledge something um, that uh, he was previously effectively denying. Right? His his affidavit of documents uh, swore in his affidavit of documents he swore that he had no relevant documents other than those listed in the schedule to the affidavit of documents. But through skillful questioning and examination for discovery, you can lead him to admit, uh, perhaps, if this is the case, uh, that he has um, uh, that he has some relevant documents he has not disclosed. Right? And then you're off to the races, right? You've got you've got ironclad evidence for your Rule 30.06 motion that he needs to uh, to disclose and, in the absence of a privilege claim, produce uh, produce those water skiing pictures that are on his uh, his hidden uh, profile. Okay, a couple other things here um, uh, that uh, you know he, the, in this particular case, uh, the defendant did not ask any questions um, in discovery. They've already had examination for discovery, uh, but the defendant didn't know about the Facebook profile. Um, until uh, um, the uh, uh, after the discovery happened, so um, so so now what are we going to do? Have they, have they lost their chance forever to ask questions that could give rise to, to evidence of these water skiing photos? Um, in such cases, as trial fairness dictates that the party who discovers the Facebook profile should enjoy some opportunity to ascertain and test whether it contains content relevant to any matter and issue. Um, so uh, so they, what one thing they could do is order them to preserve and print out the posted material um, and then uh, issue another a supplementary affidavit of documents um, and then allow further cross-examination by the defendant on that. Um, uh, so, so they could have done that themselves um, or uh, if they actually have to, they, they can come to court. Um, so, uh, so in this case, um, the, the lower court judgment is modified, overturned to some extent, right? So, so Master Dash was correct to order the plaintiff to preserve the postings and, and deliver the supplementary affidavit of documents. Um, but the court should have permitted the defendant to cross-examine on the supplementary affidavit of documents. Right, so so the defendant has already cross-examined the plaintiff once. They should be allowed to do so again, um, uh, because there's a new new affidavit of documents, and the the defendant should have another chance to perhaps establish whether uh, whether some relevant documents are missing. So the defendant is not going to get to see all of the plaintiff's um, um, Facebook pictures uh, without restriction. Um, but uh, the defendant will get to see a, a sworn supplementary affidavit of documents and then ask him questions that may 
lead to, uh, to evidence that something has not been disclosed. And if that's the case, then you would clearly be able to get a court order requiring that relevant document to, uh, to be disclosed. So uh, in terms of the language of Rule 306, um, they, uh, they order this one, right? Cross-examination um, on the affidavit of documents. These four remedies down here are, are the, the things you can get if you're successful on a Rule 30.06 motion. Okay, um, I think that's, yeah, that's it. Um, have a great week.